Right. So, uh, what are some of the reasons that people choose to homeschool? That's a big, that's a, there's a huge range, right? From, from, uh, wanting to have the highest quality of education for our children to the cost of private education or better quality education is just, it's really high. And then there's the religious and philosophical reasons. Some people want their kids to be homeschooled in an environment where they can, uh, be with other children who share the same religious views or the same philosophical views. And then, um, you know, a lot of people are concerned about the way that kids are growing up so quickly. They're exposed to so many things. Their maturity levels are just off the charts when it comes to, you know, the, all the taboo topics, right? Like sex and drugs and uh, gender issues or not issues, but like all the gender topics, right? All these things are happening and they're happening at a really fast pace. And some of us as adults aren't even prepared to have those discussions with our kids yet. They're going to school and they're going to be forced to have those conversations. And, um, my oldest is just about to turn 11. And, and so like the topics on, you know, sex and marriage and, and gender and all that, those are things that we are definitely getting ready to, to have with her because there's that thing where they say, you, if you don't have the conversation with your kids, someone else will. And obviously we want that, but I'm kind of going off on a tangent a little bit there, but basically we want to educate our kids at a pace that's, that's, um, suitable for them because not every kid can handle all of the societal issues and, 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 um, topics that are coming up. Like one of my kids is super duper mature and, um, she could handle it. And then my middle kid would probably have a broken heart every single day that she went to school when she saw that people don't have enough money to pay for lunch, when she saw that kids have uh, disabilities and broken arms, like all those things, like it would be really hard for her. And it's not that we wanna shelter our kids from the world forever and ever and ever, but we want to have the opportunity to share all that information with them in a time on a timeline that would be okay with them, right? We don't wanna scare them to death. So that was kind of a tangent, but I just know growing up myself as, a, as a, like an introvert who, um, I'm like the outgoing introvert, right? Is that what it's called? So it was hard for me to be in, in school and see all the cool kids doing the cool kids things. And I moved a lot. So growing up in the country area and then going to a, a city school like near Chicago, you guys, that was such a culture shock for me and it wasn't even a big deal. Not like what we're dealing with today with um, like the guns and the crime and the drugs and the, all that stuff. And it's happening at a younger age, right? So those are some of the things that make parents want to homeschool. And obviously there's a lot of legislature going around um, trying to be passed to take away some of our medical freedoms, such as forced vaccinations, you know, you're not welcome in the school. Now there, there are some uh, news outlets or blog outlets and things like that who want you to believe that when these laws get passed, like all hell breaks loose. And that's not necessarily true, but I do think that this is a conversation we all need to be having now. We need to be having um, plans in place. We need to understand where we draw the lines um, and how far we're willing to go to protect our medical rights. You know, uh, Kelsey, my friend, you know, here in Crunchy Supermom community, she's been saying, we need to stand up and do something more than just like run from it. And that is so, so true. But your children have to have education and they have to have it today. They have to have it tomorrow. And so, you know, if homeschooling is something that you're thinking about, you're probably thinking, where do I even start? Well, I will have, uh, if you go to crunchysupermom.com forward slash homeschool, all lowercase homeschool, you will get all of the resources that I've pulled together to share with you. And one of the first ones would be the hslda.org. That's a homeschool legal defense association. It's a nonprofit organization that uh, it, it protects our, it helps protect our rights, right? It's our civic right to homeschool. And not every state believes that, but they have, um, represented families who have homeschooling taken away from them and all kinds of things. So I actually am a member of HSLDA because my membership fee helps fund their um, their cause. And I think it's a great thing. They have a lot of great resources on there and I'll, I'll mention a couple um, specific pages to kind of look at there. And also on the blog, you can get all of those. But the other one is the homeschoolstatelaws.com. Now this one's not as um, in depth as the HSLDA because I'm not sure who puts it together, but you can click on each state and see the, the guidelines. And so um, some of the states with the highest regulations would be like Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Vermont, New York, and Pennsylvania. And when I say, and when the website says like the highest re regulations, that just means they have some rules and it's not a big deal because I've met families and, um, 
upon first glance, I mean, I got to know these families, but upon first glance when they're just like, yeah, we don't really have, we don't do anything. We don't have the books. We don't do anything. We just do life. And I take the kids to the grocery store. They learn math. And at first, I'm not going to lie. I just judged them and thought, what in the world? Like, the, no wonder people are so opposed to homeschooling and no wonder, like, the states are afraid of it because people can choose to do that. And you know what? What's funny is those kids are really, really bright and they're good with home, um, going out and, and doing life. And that's fine, that's our choice, but some states are like, no, we don't want that to happen. Some kids are sitting at home while their parents are at work and we wanna make sure that everybody's getting fed and, and getting educated because that is important. So those states have more strict laws, but not some of it just means you have to submit like copies of the curriculum you're planning to, to, to use or maybe you have to have your kids tested. And not having a passing test doesn't necessarily mean that you can't homeschool anymore. Um, in fact, I haven't found any state that has that rule, but they want you to test your kids. And so um, testing is one of the reasons that I don't want my kids in school because I don't think that all people can regurgitate information in a, in a, um, on a test. I'm someone who tests very well. I could probably sit down and take any test and get at least an 80% just right out of the gate. And then my brother, on the other hand, would be one of those ones who would fail the test, but he could probably recite the entire textbook that he didn't read, but he skimmed, okay? So I don't agree with testing, but my kids, if we ever move to one of the states that require it, they would have to take a test. So we do practice tests and there's no goal with that. It's just do it, get it done, and whatever happens, happens, okay? So some of those states do require that. And then there's a lot of states that have no regulation, and that would be um, Idaho, Alaska, Alabama, Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Connecticut, and New Jersey. So uh, these ones just don't have any kind of expectations, and they it's not that they don't care, they just haven't really put down any rules. And um, now there's some that are in the middle, and some of them have some expectations that are kind of finite and kind of annoying, like in Louisiana, for instance, which is a state where we're residing right now, uh, they, you have to declare that you're going to homeschool and you have to name your school. And so it's like the Harding family homeschool. And, um, I think that some, they might've even asked if I have like a, a degree and if I'm qualified to teach or something like that, but I didn't have to be, I just, uh, I have graduate degrees. So technically they think even though I'm horrible with kids, they think that that degree is fine enough. So it's not a big deal and you're not required to have that. I think there was a couple of options. You could be just like a home private institution or like a home education something. There was two options, not a big deal. I filled out the form, I turned it in and that was it. So uh, again, go to crunchysupermom.com forward slash homeschool and you'll get all the links that I'm gonna put up. If you um, have questions, I'd love to you know hear from you about that as well. But the other big question is people wanna know, well, how do I know what to teach? This one's kind of tricky because I, uh, being a military family, my kids have moved from coast to coast, literally coast to coast, and now we're on the south, so I guess it's kind of like a coast. Um, so the where kids are in the schools can vary wide, widely. So going to the west coast and then coming down to the south, the my kids are very much advanced from what they teach in the schools. And I look at the, um, you can go to any of the public schools usually, and you can find out the, um, forget what it's called but it's just like their uh what they plan to teach the oh my gosh I can't even think of the name of it but it tells you what where they expect to teach the kids and what they expect for them to cover and I'm always just taken back by the book list alone my kids read a lot of the books that they recommend for sixth graders they read them in first and second grade so and that's not to say that the education is poor here I'm not insulting it by any means but moving around we get a variety of um that stuff so it can vary quite a bit and so what I have always felt like was the best approach because I meet a lot of first-time homeschool moms is do not go out and buy like the entire case and curriculum from one company okay just don't do that because you're gonna get all of it you're gonna think you have to complete all of it and you you just won't like your first year will be the worst if you can give you your first year your second year is so much easier but it's always gonna be hard it just is because it's different and part of the reasons why it's hard is you. You're placing expectations on yourself to carry out homeschool education like it's school at home. Your kids are not gonna come in, you're not gonna wrap your little uh, ruler on the table and say, okay, kids, class, like sit down, put your hands in your lap and we're gonna practice arithmetic on the board, okay? It's not like that. 
It's a lot different. In fact, for us, we will eat breakfast while we're listening to our history. We will um, do our chores and then we will do math and we will do it for 15 or 20 minutes. So basically until the kindergartner finishes her unit, her little lesson, which I have to do with her. The other two kids are independently working on their math. They have a video that they listen to or watch to kind of go over the new, new um, materials if they need to. And they do their math and then we take a break. We take, the, take out the neighbor's dog, you know, whatever that is. And it's not like school. They don't have 50 minute periods. You could, but I don't think it's necessary because we can get math done in 20 to 30 minutes every day for like three to four days a week. And my kids are still finishing books um, well before the year's over. So it's very different. And if you're trying to replicate, replicate home school, like school at home, you're just gonna be really upset with yourself. And the other thing that I learned, and it was because I started off schooling my kids when they were younger doing Montessori, is that when you're going over activities, as a mom, even though I, I, um, I was a college teacher, a college professor, I was not a high school or K through 12 teacher, you're producing the information to the kid and you're expecting them to give it back to you. Like, oh yes, I understand that when you have two things and you add two more things, it equals four. And instead you're sitting there, let's skip count by two. Let's do two plus two equals four and over and over and over. And they don't spit it back out at you. You think that they're not learning, it's not working. But then later, it's funny, you'll see them say, oh, hey sister, like you have two pencils and I have two pencils, now we have four pencils. And so they get it, they just don't produce it the way that you expect them to. And that can be really challenging. And there's two types of learning um, or curriculum, it's spiral learning and then there's mastery. So with spiral learning, especially in math, they kind of visit the topics over and over. They'll, they'll just do a little bit like place value and then simple equations and then come back to place value and simple equations. So you're kind of spiral learning. Your kid could do really poorly in some of that the first time through and then better the next time. And it's kind of, for me, being a linear thinker, it didn't work very well because I couldn't see that they were learning. But for a lot of other people, they liked it because their kids didn't get bored. For us, we do math mastery, which means that you drill, not drill, because I don't like drills either, but you do the same type of concept and then it gets a little harder, a little harder, a little harder. So each page is harder. And then they compound it by doing like story problems and real life application of the math. So it just keeps getting harder. And you know that by the time they get, the, get to the end of that unit, they've mastered that. And then they revisit it later and review, of course. But it just doesn't look the way that you expect it. So that's one of the struggles. The, um, the curriculum is a personal decision, but I will always say that books and math, if you get a math program, like math you see is really, really simple. It's, it can be boring. Um, Abeka is another great one. And then we really like the good and the beautiful and don't be put off by what people say that it's like religious. I mean, the people who make it are religious, they're spiritual, but the books, you don't, it, it, you don't even notice it. They talk about nature, they talk about life. It's not, it's not a, um, I wouldn't call it like a Christian education or anything like that. Um, I love the math. I think it's probably one of the best math programs because it covers all the bases and that's what our kids are transitioning to as they create those. But the other thing is, so if you pick out a math program and just fix, stick with it, you could even get one of those workbooks at like Barnes and Noble for like third grade and just have them do it because just doing math is enough the first year. And the other thing is like Bookshark and Sunlight. They are the same company. Bookshark is the secular version and Sunlight is the Christian education version. We use Sunlight. What I love about it is that it's a book list. It's literally a book list for the grade levels and it's pretty much on par with the like Midwest and like Virginia, North Carolina, the East Coast, like the ones that are kind of at the top of the, the for country, for the United States for their uh, education ratings. They're at the top of that and the Bookshark and Sunlight list for the levels, it's pretty much on par with that. And so if you just get those books, you can get them at the library. I have a spreadsheet. If you want to see it, just let me know. Just ask for my Sunlight book, sheet, uh, book list. Um, you can get a lot from the library, Kindle, Audible, all that. Anytime you can listen to a book versus read it out loud, it'll help save your voice. But I like that these books, um, if you're studying the time period when, say, Johnny Appleseed was alive or George Washington, that's a better example. So when George Washington was alive, we will read um, a history book that's well written. It's an engaging for all ages because it's meant for homeschool. So your kindergartner can listen and your seventh grader can listen. They're all going to get something from it. And then it, you'll read that history part and then you might listen to a, a retelling of a story. And then you'll read a fiction book that's historically accurate 
built around George Washington's life. Okay, so you'll read those three things and it will layer the learning. So the kids are learning what the culture was like, what was going on in the, in the government at that time, and who George Washington was, all in one little reading session, okay? And I love that because it, it really solidifies what the kids are learning and it does it in a way that's natural and kids enjoy it. So I really, I, I love that. And I think that if you're brand new, you can't lose by picking up the Sunlight book list. Now, if you go to Sunlight and you look at the website, some of their stuff seems really expensive, but if you just get the book list by requesting the sample and maybe you pick up like their core, um, like they call them core, core A, B, C, D, um, their little core package of uh, paperwork. It helps you with discussion questions, things like that. Just get that, go to the library and buy all the books. It'll save you a lot of money, but you can just trust that you're teaching your kids enough for the first year. Now, here we are, my, my kid, my oldest kid is 11 right now, or about to be 11, and we've added extra stuff. We've added chemistry, and we've added advanced history, and sometimes we spend more time in science. Um, it's because we've, we've had the chance to see how we can learn, right? But the core is that reading and math. So I'm going to check my notes here. I had a couple more questions to cover. Um, <clears throat> There's also the online. So, okay, that's the other thing I was gonna share. So there's co-ops. So the co-ops can be things that you pay to join. The Classical Conversations is a, I think it's global now, but it's at least throughout the United States where people get together. It is Christian based, but it's community style learning. You meet once a week. We participate in it for the social aspect. So it's not really my favorite um, type of learning because it's very much memory memorization based. Um, so anyway, there's online options too where you can actually register for homeschooling online, high school online, things like that. And then there's other just local co-ops. And if there isn't one, if one doesn't exist and you can't find it on Facebook or otherwise, you might have to create it. And you'd be really surprised at how many um, people are near you that actually wanna do the same thing and so you guys can create it together, even if it's just getting together. And that kind of goes back to the socialization thing a lot of people think that kids who are homeschooled don't get the opportunity to socialize, but they actually do. It just requires a little bit more effort on your part and kind of some commitment. You might either have to spend a little bit more money to participate in activities, or you just have to travel more or go do things, you know, to make sure that they get to see other kids. So our kids do um, some sports. So anyway, the personality, what if you yourself as a mom don't have the personality to teach kids. I don't. I'm so bad with kids other than my own. And I'm not the best. Uh, I'm not a perfect parent. No, none of us are. But I'm really bad with other people's kids. So I never would have thought that I would homeschool either. And I'm someone who likes to have a career. So I always knew that if I did stay home, I would still want to work part time or at least have my own business. And that's a challenge. But it's totally possible and there's a lot of moms who do that and so I just think that you have to adapt. Back to the thing with socialization, it can be crazy but you have to think about this too. If your kids were in school, in a public school, you're running them to things or you're picking them up from things or you're not spending time with them and um, it, it's no different than if you're homeschooling and you have to travel to kind of get the activities for them as well. It's just a little bit of it here or a little bit of it there. Okay, going back to the me time, having time for yourself, and having a break for your kids. Okay, that's a big one, and that's something where you you can't be totally fly by the seat of your pants, okay? I have yet to meet a mom or a family who homeschools, or they unschool, or they just don't have any structure, who also wants to run a business, or have a career, or have some other ambition outside of just being like a really good wife, mom, household manager, homeschooler, you know, that kind of thing. Now, those, those um, if that's your ambition, then that's great. You don't have to fit into any kind of schedule, but if you want to run a business or something, you're going to have to have a time budget. It, it's There's just no way around it. And the more you resist it, the more unhappy you're going to be because you're going to feel like you're neglecting something, whether it's yourself, your career ambitions, or your kids. You have to set up a schedule and a time budget, and it doesn't have to be a rigid routine. In fact, um, it would take me a long time to kind of show you what I do. So what I've set up is um, at crunchysupermom.com forward slash mastermind, you can get on the waiting list to kind of learn about that because that is me working one-on-one -on -one with you and um, some other ladies to set up your life so that you can fit all these things in, your, your time budget, 
your cleaning routine, your meal plans, and even your business, right? So I can help with that. But in the meantime, you could also uh, visit any of the courses that I have. Anything that's related to time, like the rescue mission, the time budgeting course, anything like that will help with figuring out your time schedule. Even if you're someone who can't stand um, structure, because you do have to have some kind of structure. It just can look different for everyone. Now, a couple questions that are here and they're a little bit more challenging. It's what if your kids love school or they have special needs and they have services through the school? Those are some really good questions. So um, I think that if my kid loves school, I would try school in the middle of the year. Like I would pull them out and homeschool them or I would start in the summer so we could get into the routine. Show them the benefits and like the cool things that happen because you have that flexibility and more time together. And you know, you can always take them back and you can always promise them that they can go back if it's really not working, but you can, all you can do is give it a shot, right? And then with the um, special needs, if you go to HSLDA, and again, crunchysupermom.com forward slash homeschool, the link, specific link for this is there, but the HSLDA has some resources on what to do for special needs services and things like that. And um, you might find that you have to pay more out of pocket for things or you might not. It just really depends on the region and the, and the place where you live. But a lot of moms choose to homeschool their kids because of their special situations, right? That it's hard to um, be integrated. I mean, for a long time, any child who had any kind of special attention requirements, whether it was just like a hyperactive child or just a kid who couldn't sit still and be calm, all the way up to true learning disability and things like that, they used to separate them, right? We all know about the, whatever they would call it, like the special ed room, which we cannot say that anymore. And now uh, we're pushing to fully integrate all of those kids who have all of those needs into the regular classroom and the classrooms are huge. I don't really think that those kids are getting like the best education for themselves. Neither, you know, are the teachers getting, you know, the best opportunity to give of themselves because they're being stretched so thin. So you have to wonder, are those services super amazing? I mean, could you not provide them yourself? Uh, could you not find a specialist that you could visit that could teach you how to do some of those things for your kids? And then I know that there's community respite situations where they have nothing to do with the school. It's just specifically based on a diagnosis and criteria. So start at HSLDA and kind of get some information there. And um, yeah, I know that this was like a down and dirty and I ran through everything. You know, the biggest thing is it's, it's a personal decision. All you can do is try it. And um, the first year is awful. And so if you can just kind of make it through the first year and give yourself the second year to try it again, and it, it, it'll just flow better. It, it'll, you'll kind of get into a groove, but you can't be too hard on yourself. And I think com, coming together in a community like we have here with Crunchy Supermom can be great because you can talk about things together and um, where you're at the first year that you homeschool, the first moment that you start to homeschool is so different from where you'll be at the end of your first or second year. And like I said, I started homeschooling my kids from the very beginning. We did the Montessori activities at home. And even then I would spend my nights laminating and cutting things like printing and cutting and all this stuff. And my kid was not even a year old, you guys. And I would just have everything. I'm like, as soon as she shows an interest in wanting to learn her colors, I will have everything I need to show her. And it's so funny because none of that's necessary. The kids learn colors. I don't teach the alphabet. I teach the sounds and everything just kind of falls into place. Uh, it is kind of true that just living life, your kids can learn a whole lot and it's just that other application so that they can fill out a test. They can complete a test to get into college. Then they have to have some kind of formal education. But in all honesty, this stuff that we learn K through 12, with a few exceptions like foreign language and like chemistry and advanced biology and things like that, you do learn almost everything of every bit of the basics just by being alive and being around your family during the day, all day, just being a homeschooler. They learn a lot. My kids are entrepreneurial and they understand economy. And my kid was saying like, well, why did a, did a George Washington pay like a penny for a potato and now they're so expensive? And she's like, what's that called when it gets bigger, when the cost of things gets bigger? And I'm like, it's called inflation. And you use the exact right words to describe it. So they just learn it naturally. So 
Uh, I hope this was helpful. I'd love to come on and ha answer any other questions that come up, but I don't want to go too long because I know none of us moms have more than 20, 30 minutes to sit around anyway, if we even get that. So crunchysupermom.com forward slash homeschool and crunchysupermom.com forward slash mastermind if you want to get on the waiting list to learn about the program that is starting in January where we will work one-to-one -to, -one to figure out your life, get your life in order so you can be a productively present parent. So have a great day.